But first, as we start our extended lockdown period, more and more voices are being brave enough to question whether keeping the nation at home is really the best course of action. The government, as you know, has repeatedly stated the need to stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. And we, the public, have largely taken it to heart and shouted down anyone that questions that logic. But now, with little evidence of an exit strategy and demands coming from both inside the Tories and also from the new Labour leader, Keir Starmer, for more transparency about how long this lockdown will last, the government has a bit of pressure on. Those questions have been asked in a fascinating column this week in The Spectator by the best-selling author Lionel Shriver, who asks whether it's herd mentality rather than herd immunity we should be worried about. Lionel joins me now, and it was a very brave column to write, Lionel, because you rightly point out that at the moment the public has been largely brainwashed in terms of believing this government line, and this is what you have to say, the government has succeeded all too horribly well. The British have bought the lockdown hook, line and sinker. Whereas in fact, and this is a point that I have made on the show, Lionel, the lockdown was designed to ensure that the NHS wasn't overrun and clearly the NHS hasn't been overrun. So we do have to start looking now at how we lift it, don't we? Uh, yes, I mean, they've changed the remit for the lockdown without ever addressing it. Uh, it used to be to save the NHS, and now it's just to keep us from spreading the virus. And that's an unending project. And therefore, there is no logical point at which you exit. No, indeed. And part of that change, perhaps, has been because in these circumstances that none of us could have predicted. Boris Johnson, who was very reluctant to shut down the country immediately, nearly died from coronavirus. And he, according to reports, has gone from one of the most hawkish within the cabinet to a dove now and, and someone who doesn't want to lift the lockdown too soon. Can you understand why the Prime Minister would have had that conversion given what he's been through? Oh, sure. I mean, I have to say that my heart fell when I heard that he was infected and fell yet again when he went into the ICU. And uh, it was, all, of course, partially because I was concerned for the prime minister and I wanted him to be well and I support this government. Uh, but it was also because I had a feeling it would have an impact on policy. It would have an impact on public opinion because the uh, prime minister himself becoming gravely ill is highly emotive and it makes people uh, personalize the virus in a way that makes us more fear fearful. And it was also likely to have an effect on uh, Boris himself because he had such a close call that, you know, the, the virus seems frightening to him also in a, in a very personal way. Uh, I just find this regrettable in a, in, in a larger way than just it, it must have been difficult for him to go through and it was difficult for us to go through that anxiety. Uh, it creates an emotional uh, atmosphere that sets us back on the project of putting this catastrophe in perspective. And that also means getting, uh, getting perspective on the larger catastrophe that is ongoing uh, outside our window. Every day we're in lockdown, this country is, you can't hear it, you can't see it, but it's falling apart. Isn't the point, though, that that may all be well and good? And obviously people are worried about the economy and worried about getting life back on track. However, if it is a direct choice between staying in lockdown or potentially losing your grandmother or your father or your uncle, Actually, the public is saying, no, we're prepared to take that risk. We're prepared to keep the lockdown going because we all probably know someone now, Lionel, that has either died or come close to dying from COVID-19. Well, I think we have to get away from this opposition of, you know, it's either the money or people's lives. Money, uh, money is to do with people's lives. It keeps keeps us alive. It keeps us keeps our, the systems through which we are managed to survive and thrive within close quarters and uh, in high density. The economy is not 
just an abstraction and it's not just about greed and and piling up a big bank account it's about being able to have enough money in your pocket to go to the supermarket and buy dinner and you know we live in a complex society and it was very challenging to put together that complex society it's really easy to make it fall apart and uh so it's true uh, we need to protect people who are especially susceptible to this virus, but that doesn't mean uh, protecting all the younger, healthy people who are likely to get a fairly mild case, with a few outliers, I admit. But there is so much at stake in continuing to have a viable country with companies in it that you can work for and and uh, uh, a a government that is not so indebted that it, it ends up having to print money like fury and inflate all the nation's wealth away. I mean, we're playing with huge systems and th that that are going to get that are getting completely out of whack. Yeah. And what is at stake is our lives, our collective uh, ability to survive and weather further problems. I mean, this this virus isn't the last trouble to come along and we have to be able to you know face further challenges down the line i mean what i'm really exasperated with is that i think right now we really we need leadership and that's why boris is being out of commission right now yes, is because you're concerned about a lot of this political reporting that says the government are waiting for public opinion to turn against the lockdown and then at that point they will change the policy. And in fact... Oh, it's I, just ludicrous. It's asked backwards. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the public believes what it believes because it was told to believe those things. And then you turn around and say, but the, the public believes this, so we can't, we can't defy it. Uh, that isn't leadership. You know, we, we hear all the time about how we're really involved in a war. Where, but in a war, what you care about is the protection of the country itself. And in a war, you do make some sacrifices of human lives in order to protect everyone else. And I'm afraid that's what we're going to do in the circumstances. And what we're right now, we're told we're engaged in a war, but we can't we we are going to protect everyone. But in the process of trying to and failing to protect everyone, we put everyone at risk. You're also concerned about President setting. You say we cannot install nationwide suffocation as the standard parliamentary response to any new illness. And of course, it's not necessarily just new illnesses, Lionel. There could be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth waves of this. And so your argument is when that happens again, we can't go into such a draconian lockdown, I presume. Oh, yeah. One of the things that I found horrifying about the whole political conversation is that the government is blithely assuming that if there is any, you know, rise in uh, deaths or infection rates, then immediately we'll go right back into lockdown. It's as if there never was any other solution to an infectious disease. Whereas, actually, what's new is not the fact that we have yet another virus. We have to deal with new viruses all the time. What's new is, the, the, is this solution which is frankly bizarre and flagrantly self-destructive, if not suicidal. We need to talk about the media as well, because you do raise it in your column. And this show has been one of the only shows that has regularly featured a whole wide range of opinions about this crisis and about lockdown without any hysteria attached. But you point out that actually most of the mainstream media has had a very homogenised approach to, I guess, the viewpoints and the guests that you will hear from. And contrarian viewpoints and people who want the lockdown to end earlier or maybe didn't want it to start in the beginning have quite literally been thrown off the air, haven't they? We haven't heard from them. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate your station for airing some different opinions. I mean, that's not the form. I mean, every time I turn on the BBC or Sky, I mean, you know, there's no point in, in finger pointing because they're all the same. So, uh, and, and uh, most of the concentration is on PPE and uh, there's lots of hospital footage. And there's a, you know, a little bit of reference to the damage it's having on the economy, 
but it's always referred to as a kind of unfortunate little byproduct that we skip quickly over. Um, and, you know, the, the fact is that the media and the government, even uh, media that regard them as, themselves as uh, in opposition to the government, the media and the government are in lockdown lockstep. Nobody is, is saying, hold on here, maybe this doesn't actually work or maybe this isn't necessary, look at Sweden, they are not doing the same thing, and they're having, their their, their uh, death rates are tracing pretty much the same arc as ours are, um, are we making a mistake? And, you know, I, I can't remember ever being in this country at a time when something enormous was happening that, uh, obviously uh, demands looking at it from every possible viewpoint because the consequences are so considerable. And then everyone just agrees with everything. There's only one line. I mean, the, the feeling is right now that if you don't agree with the lockdown, first of all, you're an idiot. And secondly, you're treasonous. And it, the, the, the understanding is that, that anybody who says a discouraging word about this approach is uh, somehow, uh, you know, out of it or, or, or murderous in intent, you know. Oh, and they don't, they don't care about old people. No, indeed. It is a provocative and thought-provoking column in this week's Spectator. That is Lionel Shriver, the best-selling author and columnist.